our scripture today, it comes from Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 1. The priests and the te- captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the temp- people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign. We cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak any longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened, for the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This is the word of God for the people of God. Okay, let's start today with a little bit of biblical math. It's going to be really easy math, so those of you that are math phobic, you don't need to worry too much. Did you notice in verse 4 that it says that at this point now, there were now 5,000 men who believed? Isn't that cool? The church had grown to 5,000 men. But grown from what? Well, at the end of Acts chapter 2, it says that the number was 3,000. So here's the time for math. What's 5,000 minus 3,000? 2,000. Isn't that pretty good? They have one giant vacation Bible school. And they add 2,000 people to the church. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. It wasn't vacation Bible school. They had a revival meeting. Had a preacher come in from out of town. Great musicians and added to... No, that's not what they did either. So what did they do to get these 2,000 people to come? Because that's what we want, right? We we want people now in a little town like Fairfield. Do we have 5,000 people in town? That's going to be kind of hard. Now, if we go out to all the outskirts and environs, sure, we can get 5,000. But 500? 50? Oh, we've got to start somewhere, right? But we want that. So what do we need to do if we're going to see the kind of results that we see here in Acts chapter 4? Well, what we have to see is that what happens in chapter 4 flows directly out of what happens in Acts chapter 3. The beginning of Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they're going up to the temple to pray. They're going up to spend time with God. 
And as they go, they come across a lame man, a man who can't walk, been lame since birth, sitting there at the gate, and he's begging. And the man looks at him and says, hey guys, can you help a poor beggar? Give me five bucks so I can go to McDonald's tonight. I just want to eat. I'm hungry. And if you remember, Peter and John look at the guy. And Peter says, I don't have any silver, don't have any gold, but what I have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, they don't do here what Jesus did sometimes. Sometimes when somebody needed healing, Jesus would quietly pull them aside away from the crowd into private and do the healing. Not all the time, but some of the time. They do this thing right out there in the open. And the healing is one of those things that when it happens, people know that it happened. Because the lame guy didn't just say, oh, I, I feel okay right now. Thanks for praying for me. This guy who was lame, this guy who everybody knew was lame, jumps up. He's walking and leaping and praising God. So Peter and John heal the guy. They do it in public. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows what's going on. And there in Acts chapter 3, it says the people, they're excited, they're astonished. And they're confused. They don't understand. They don't understand how it happened. They don't understand what it means. So they do what we do, and we're astonished and confused and don't know what that means. We start asking questions. These guys ask questions of Peter and John. Hey, what's going on here? And Peter and John, they get up and start answering the questions. That's what we see here in Acts chapter 3, is an occasion to start asking questions. And, and this that we see in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 flows out of Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is still with the disciples. He's been teaching them after the resurrection. And he says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem. That's where they are right here still. In all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit come. They receive power. Strange things happen. Peter gets up and answers their questions. Chapter 3, the Holy Spirit is there. Empowered by the Spirit, they heal the man. But let's push back just another step. Not only is what we see in Acts chapter 3 and 4 based on what we see in Acts chapter 1 and 2, but the book of Acts is volume 2 of the books by Luke. So if we go back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, we see this in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee. This is after his, his temptation, after his baptism. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. There's the Spirit again. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth. Nazareth was the town he was raised in, where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Have any of you ever used a scroll before? I mean, I really like this modern format of books. We have random access now. Scrolls, they're sequential access. You have to start at the beginning and work your all the way through. So here he is. He's unscrolling all the way through because what he's going to read right here comes toward the end of Isaiah. He found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit's on me. He's doing this. But then Jesus added one more line. Verse 23, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This kingdom of God work done through the Holy Spirit is not just something Jesus said, okay, it's going to happen someday. Jesus said, it's happening now. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus had said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses. That's not just someday, that's Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 3, that is happening. 
The disciples are living within, they're operating within the same kingdom of God that Jesus inaugurated. And I want to claim today the same kingdom that we live in with, within today. The same Holy Spirit's available to us. So let's try another way of looking at this. When we look at what they're doing here, we see Peter and John doing something that causes people to ask questions. They heal the man. That's not every day. That's unusual. The people ask questions. When Peter and John were there, they started answering the questions. They were bold enough to say, hey, guys, this is Jesus. They didn't look at themselves and say, well, we went to medical school, so we know how to do this. They didn't say, we've been to seminary, so we know how to do this. They didn't say, well, we're ordained, so we know how to do this. They didn't say, we are really, really special, so that's how we did it. They emphasized in their teaching that it wasn't them, it was Jesus. So we have an event that causes people to ask questions. We have people that are bold enough to stand up and give answers. And they point at Jesus. So what I see here is, is, is the work that they did in healing the man was providing a picture if any of you ever looked at a picture, and you look at the picture, and you try to figure out what it is, and, and however hard you work at it, you can't quite figure out what it is you're seeing in the picture. But then you notice there's some words beneath the picture. You, you know what they call those words beneath the picture? The caption. And when you read the caption, then you know what's in the picture. And sometimes if the picture's confusing enough, you'll read the caption and say, oh, so that's what it is. Now it's obvious. So the work of God that we see Peter and John doing for this lame man is like a picture. It's a picture of who God is, what he's about, how his kingdom works. But the people don't understand until Peter and John get up and provide a caption. The words that help them understand what it is they've seen. And that they're seeing. And the caption here is all about Jesus. So this work that they've done, providing the picture and providing the caption that points at Jesus, produces two big things. The first one I mentioned at the very beginning. There's 2,000 people that come to faith. 2,000 people see the picture, hear the caption, Put their faith in this Jesus they were talking about. Isn't that awesome? But there's another thing that happens. The authorities get disturbed. The authorities are unhappy. They thought they'd taken care of Jesus. They thought they'd had him nailed down, filed away. They thought Jesus was dead and gone. And yet, here's these two guys, Peter and John, causing a ruckus, preaching the resurrection. Here, here they are, right in their face, saying, you tried to put him away. You tried to do away with him. It didn't work. God rejected your condemnation of Jesus. You failed. Now, this... This causes problems for Peter and John because the authorities are disturbed. They put Peter and John in prison for the night. Now, as far as I know, none of you have ever spent a night in prison. And I'm assuming none of you want to. Prison doesn't have a really good reputation. It's a place we want to be, except maybe if we're visiting. Here's Peter and John. Just, they're just calmly going out of business. They're doing even something good for somebody. And they end up in jail for it. I mean, all they're doing is going to church to pray. They go into the temple to pray. They help a lame man. Not sure that cost them a little bit. They were planning to go to the temple to pray, and they end up healing a guy and messes up their whole plan, you know? But then they get the interruption of jail. The interruption of being put on trial here. But as far as I can tell, they don't mind. 
because they've been following Jesus. And how did it go with Jesus? Did, was, was it the case that every place Jesus went, people said, oh, it's Jesus, we just love everything you do and everything you say. Well, if we go back to that passage I read earlier from Luke chapter 4, people are really excited at first, but by the, the end of that story, they're ready to kill him. And that's Jesus, the Son of God. Or you have Jesus coming into Jerusalem his last week. Great messages, great miracles. And how do the authorities respond? Hey, Jesus, we're glad to have you here. Now yeah, they put him on trial, whip him, beat him, crucify him, kill him. Jesus has taught Peter and John and the others to know what to expect. These guys aren't surprised. But because they've been with Jesus, they're also at a place where they expect it, and it doesn't bother them because they see the fruit that's coming from it. So the authorities here, they call them to account because they are making such a big ruckus. The authorities notice, Luke says, that they were unschooled, ordinary men. These weren't guys that had a college degree. These weren't guys that had a high school diploma. Y'all know that having significant education is a very modern phenomenon, don't you? I do family history as a hobby, and as I go back on census records, maybe back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, they used to ask a question, like, how much schooling do you have? And it was common, looking at those censuses, to see people whose advanced schooling was maybe fourth grade, third grade, maybe none. So here's these guys. The authorities look at Peter and John and said, these guys are uneducated. They're ordinary. They're riffraff. And yet they're doing this. How can that be? They don't have any authority. But then, notice again, Peter and John are bold. They don't say, okay, guys, we're sorry. We know we're supposed to submit to authority. We're supposed to submit to those who are more educated. So, yeah, we'll just go off quietly and mind our own business. But they're bold. Here in chapter 4, they do the same thing as chapter 3. They say, we're preaching. We're doing this in the name of Jesus, the same Jesus that you crucified. But God raised from the dead. That's our authority. In chapter 3, they had said that and said, you can repent. You can turn from your ways that led you to kill the Messiah. You can experience life in him. This, they imply that to this crowd too. To the Sadducees, to the Pharisees, to the temple guards. The leaders see their boldness. And Luke explicitly here ties their boldness to their being full of the Holy Spirit. So again, we see here in chapter 4 the recurrence of the picture and the caption. The picture is their boldness, their fearlessness. The caption is their words about Jesus, who He is and what He's done. I believe that God wants to extend His kingdom the same way today that he did here in the book of Acts. He wants to show pictures through us that make people ask questions. He wants to show pictures in us as the Spirit changes us, as the Spirit transforms us, as the Spirit makes us new people in Christ. Pictures that the world looks at and says, oh, what's going on here? You're strange, you Christians. You church people, I don't get you. Now, the world gets a lot of what we do. The world gets busyness. The world gets having meetings. The world doesn't get changed lives. The world doesn't get people who, who are sinners, who are turning away from their sin. The world doesn't get people who are filled with love for people that are unlovable. And yet, that's the kind of picture that God calls us to, the kind of pictures that the Spirit works in our life to exhibit. Now, now I've used this word bold, boldness. And I know some of you, you hear that and you, you, your thought is, well, that's just not me. 
I'm quiet, I'm shy, I'm introverted, I like minding my own business. It's okay if somebody else gets up there and talks. It's okay if somebody goes anywhere and talks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit down and be quiet and mind my own business. Boldness, that's not me. But let me give you another translation here. The word that's translated boldness here can also be translated openness. What would happen if we started thinking on those terms? That we experience God's work in our life. Not just that we get our get out of hell free card, but that we experience the Spirit working in our lives, reproducing the fruit of the Spirit, bringing us forgiveness, delivering us from isolation, from loneliness, from despair, from anxiety, from brokenness, from bondage. What would happen if we were open about God's work in our life? If we didn't present the image, yeah, we're church people, we have it all together. I mean, the world knows we don't have it all together. And when we let them know that we know we don't have it together, and yet God's working in us, that's openness. And the world's going to look at those pictures they see in our lives and say, why are you open about that? I mean, if, if that was my truth, I'd be hiding I wouldn't want anybody to know that about me. Or they might say, I, I struggle with some of those things too. How, how can you experience change here? How can you experience peace? How can you come to love those kind of people? How can you forgive people when they've done that to you? When we're open, people can see those pictures of God's grace, of God's reality in us. But that provides the next problem, doesn't it? Because when we're open, when people see that, guess what they're going to do? They're going to ask questions. And guess what we get to do? Get to answer them. Now, we can do what Peter and John did right here. We don't have to use our advanced degrees. We don't have them. We don't have to use our great articulateness, putting words together. We can maybe just say, it's Jesus. I don't understand it. But it's Jesus. He's done it. And it's available to you just as it was available to me. What would happen if we as a church became people who lived openly? Open ourselves to God? Became open to each other about God's continuing work in our lives? became open to even outsiders about God's work in life? What would happen if we exhibited those kinds of pictures? I think it'd make a difference. I, I, I'm even of the opinion that, that the greatest thing that we can do as a church is not more advertising, more signage. Oh, that's fine. It's not, it's not more programs. It's not more busyness. But it's transformed lives. It's people coming to know Jesus. It's people experiencing His forgiveness, His healing, His power in their lives. It's people that make the difference. And my prayer today is that wherever you're at, you'll take that next step of opening yourself up to Jesus. And maybe if you've done that, you could maybe even take the next step of opening yourself up to people around you. It might be at first opening your family, maybe to a friend. But God wants to use you as a picture of his grace, of his mercy, of who Jesus is and what he's up to. And then give you the chance to say, it's Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that when we look at Jesus in the Bible, we don't just see some guy that lived a long time ago and had stuff to say. Not just a guy that lived a long time ago and even did miracles. But someone who died for our sins. Someone that you raised from the dead. Somebody who is now sitting on the throne, your right hand, ruling and reigning. Lord, pour out your spirit afresh on us today so we can see the changed lives so we can see the pictures like we see in the book of Acts. Lord, we invite you, we give you freedom to do that in our lives and our life together. 
Love you. Amen.